Hello. Okay. Woo! Um, switching to four. <laughs> okay. Here's my slides on my computer, not for you. Fair enough. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be here, especially that uh, I can help my friend Mark out that I know for years now. I'm also pretty scared about the setting here with your little tables and the lights. I feel like I'm supposed to give a dance in between you and like go there, and, but you don't want to see that. Okay, technology is not our friend again. Okay, now we have it. I'm switching here. Okay. Fair enough. There we go. Okay. Again, thanks for coming. I'm going to talk a bit about breaking the barriers about the browsers and the internet that we have at the moment uh, as a starter. So there's lots of stuff coming your way. The slides will be online. All the stuff is online. Everything I'm talking about today is open source. Everything I'm, I'm talking about is partly Mozilla, but also Google and other companies involved in it. All of what you're going to see today needs you to help us with it. Because it's all the things on the web, we can't wait for big companies to do cool stuff and move it forward. It needs you to use the things that are there to make it a reality. And sadly enough, a lot of times we just wait for somebody to do cool stuff before we use it. And that's not the idea of the web. But let's do a bit of a history uh, uh, thing. I mean, I was confused by the title of the conference because I thought about it. It's about Talleyrand is the first prime minister of France in 1815. And actually, most of the stuff that we're going to be talking about, he has no clue about. So it's obviously beyond him. So there's really no point to that. And I was a bit confused, but then I'm like, ah, Teleron, now I get it. So I have history with Mark, the organizer of the conference. And I, I promised him to shame him a bit on stage about this. Um, we work together on the best computer on this planet, the Commodore 64. and. All your, uh, all your Sinclair people can suck it. And uh, what Mark did was things like that. Mark did uh, online graphics for our BBS, for our uh, mailbox, before we had the internet. That was the stuff to, make, to keep people occupied while it was loading on a 2400 modem or like one of those acoustic things. And that's what he did. So he was also co-sys of, of, um, of our mailbox there. I, on the other hand, did the things directly on the computer. This is obviously not the best thing I've ever done, but it has a parallax scroller in it. And everybody goes crazy in CSS about this. So I thought I'd show it to you that we've done that in 2001, something like that. So all in all, this was geeky as hell, uh, like that Ubuntu release party here. <laughs> but we learned a few things from that. We basically learned that when you have a um, a limited environment, when you have something that is basically a technical barrier, you have to become creative with it. And you have to do something with it to make it more beautiful and better. And you have to push the boundaries of the barrier rather than whining that the barrier is there. So we learned that there is connectivity issues. With our BBS, we always had to find out how to get the fastest connections that are somehow there without paying a lot of money. We also learned that there is limited hardware access. And that's the same on the internet. We have great computers, but we can't expect everybody to have these computers. And even more annoyingly, we've got these really cool mobile phones, but with web technology, we're not allowed to get access to all the cool stuff they have. So that's just unfair. We also learned that there is an unknown or fixed environment. You might not have a, an end user that can upgrade to a browser. They still have to use Internet Explorer 6. But we cannot just tell them to. And there's two things to do that on the web with that. There's progressive enhancement, just test before you apply things, and there is a responsive design. So there's, these are the solutions, and you're going to hear about them today from other people, so I didn't cover them. But it's quite easy on the web to be much more creative than we were on Commodore 64, because all these things can be changed over time, and we're working in an environment that changes constantly. So the modern technology is available in the browser. This is uh, C64 yourself. So you can drag and drop an image from your desktop into your browser, and it converts it to this cool C64 style image. And then you can save it and put it on the internet as, oh, I'm so awesome, I'd know the C64. And nothing of that is server-side. 
All of that works in the browser, works across the browsers that we have right now, and it means that, that we can do calculations there that in the past were only for people that know about server-side computing. So we have really no excuse not to use them. It always annoys me when people are like, well, this browser doesn't do that, and that browser doesn't do that. If you don't use the things, then browser vendors will not find bugs that they can fix. So it's a chicken and egg problem. If you don't use the technology that we have right now and the cool stuff that I wanted to have 10 years ago, then we cannot fix them. So rich HTML semantics, put them in there, fair enough. Self-validating forms. I mean, just a required on a form element. Now make sure that the form doesn't get sent off. How cool is that? Um, Richer form controls with fallbacks. If I have a range control in, in WebKit, that's basically a slider. In other browsers, it's an input box. That's, that's still a good, uh, a good way of inputting numbers, but it means that you, in, the, in the better browser, you actually get a really, really cool control, so use them. Canvas for painting in the browser. Don't actually go and do image matching and create images when you don't need to create them. CSS gradients, multiple backgrounds, animation and transition. There's so many cool things you can do with CSS in day-to-day -day websites, not only on iPhones. So it's there for you. CSS 3D transforms, now also in Firefox. So all these WebKit-only CSS transforms you've done, just put a Mozilla thing there as well, and then it works across the browsers. Local storage and offline storage. SVG for scalable interactive graphics. Request animation frame instead of set timeout. So you, your, your, your computer actually doesn't do the animation when the tab is not active. Really good idea. History API, if you've got AJAX controls and you still want to have bookmarking and back and forward in the browser, the history API does that for you. WebGL for 3D stuff. We got all these things and there's no excuse not to use them because we need you to use that stuff and we need you to play with it because otherwise we just do it and nobody uses it so we're not going to give it any love. And taking on challenges. Instagram a few days ago had this challenge of like a shredded image. So they took the image into slices and rearranged the slices randomly. And the competition, like if you're cool enough to start working for Instagram, you can use Python, Ruby or C++ to actually turn that image that was shredded into the real image. Joe Lambert from the US said like, okay, uh, from the UK, why server side? He did it in Canvas and JavaScript in the, in the browser, across the different browsers. And that's what we can do. We can take on challenges that in the past were only server, now on the, uh, on the computer itself and on the browser itself. So this is a conference for aiming high. I was asked to be, go beyond the Tellerrand to do something that you didn't think before. So a lot of the stuff I'm going to show is quite impressive and moves the internet and the browser technology forward, rather than just telling you like, oh, look, HTML forms, they're awesome. And a lot of this stuff is already available to you, but people don't use it because they, they never heard of it or they don't want it, they don't trust it yet, but you can do that. So the first thing is breaking the browser mold. People are getting very annoyed that the browser always has like these toolbars on top of it and you just have all the things, your applications run inside a browser, they still feel like a website. They don't feel like an application in the browser. So one thing we've done, and uh, uh, Chrome as well, is that you can have your own toolbars. So you can see here uh, on the, on, in the back, that's Google Maps. So instead of having a URL field there, out of a sudden you have to have the maps controls in the browser. And that makes it an application in the browser and not just a website open in the browser. On the bottom you got uh, uh, Google Docs, which now have an Excel style menu. So how do you do this? As, what magic is going on there? Well, I can show it to you live. This is... Um, Firefox here running on my machine, the Firefox that mom and dad uses nowadays that people can download. So I can now go on this image here and do a right click and I've got a rotate function out of a sudden in the right click menu of the browser. I can rotate and it rotates the image. I can resize and it resizes the image and I can undo those, both, of, both of those. Of course, like, ah, the, you work for Mozilla, you probably have a nightly build and these kind of things. This is the HTML to do that. All you have to do is say the context menu equals image menu, and then you have an ID image menu on a menu element with menu items in them, and another menu uh, listed in there that actually would just do the resize. And that's how you can do a context menu. This is how you can do a right-click menu to do things natively. None that is using jQuery UI or something like that, but one that is supported completely by the browser. You can use that now, and it's supported by Firefox at the moment. Chrome is working on it as well. 
So when Chrome has it, you already have it in there. That's a really good idea to do these kind of things. Full screen API, people are going nuts about this because uh, I wanted full screen, I want my video, HTML5 video never took off because it can't be full screen like Flash video is. Now we have a full screen API both in Gecko and Firefox and there's amazing opportunities there, especially for gaming as well. You want to have the full screen, not inside the browser. But there's also security issues. What if I can pop up a full screen interface that looks like a browser and asks you to type in things that isn't really a browser? And seeing that all browsers are actually written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, it's not that hard to make a browser interface inside a browser. So that's something we're discussing at the moment. Another thing that I've been talking about for a while is that we're developing on the web with offline technology. We all have our editors that we love, except for VI and Emacs people. This is technically on the internet. But uh, most of the people have an IDE, and they're actually doing things on, the, uh, on their own computer and then send it to the web. The web is an interconnected thing of computers. And when I talk with other developers and I build with other people, why do I have to actually send them an email and, or send them the code or send them to GitHub when they could be editing with me in the web? And the first thing to do with that is actually getting kids onto the web and onto computing. This is Hackasaurus. It's a project uh, sponsored by Mozilla. And instead of telling kids, like, oh, this is HTML, here's how you do your first line of code, here's, this is a doc type, all these like, really boring things, we just built this little um, bookmarklet that allows you to highlight things on the page and just move your mouse around and you see the, uh, the HTML around that, what's going on there. And then you press R to change the content, and then you can actually take the image and copy a different URL in there, like the serious cat in this case, and out of a sudden, you've got a different image in there. So instead of telling kids, like, oh, write this, save it somewhere, open it in your browser, they can mess with any website out there. And then they have a sharing thing where they actually start sending it to other people. We had the Mozilla Festival in London, where a 12-year-old went on stage and was proud as punch of changing the BBC website to something cool. And this is the kind of stuff we should actually invite people to do, rather than, like, it's really hard to be a web developer. You need this and that. Cloud9 IDE from Ajax.org, the guys from Amsterdam, and they got funding now, is the other side of that spectrum. It's a full IDE in the browser with GitHub integration. So you don't need to have anything installed on the computer where you want to actually work on, uh, on some piece of code with other people. It's collaborative coding in the browser with the same responsiveness and the same richness of a real IDE. And a lot of people are scared of that. They don't trust it because for years we always like, yeah, you can edit in the browser. It's like, OK, almost showed up. Oh, it's there. But with Cloud9 IDE, they're doing a really, really good job. So take a look at that and play with that. Because um, a lot of times when I was, for example, contracting, I was on client machines, like, and they gave me like Visual Studio or things I didn't want to use. So you could use Cloud IDE on the web instead. Scratchpad in the browser that we just released is actually a JavaScript editor in the browser. So instead of having to write a JavaScript and do breakpoints and debug that way, you can write any JavaScript and run it against the page. And if you, don't, if you only want to have parts of it, you just highlight part of the script and run that against the page. So that's a great way of debugging a JavaScript live on the website without having to send it through your build process or FTP or whatever you do, you update your stuff. You can style in the browser as well. You've got a style editor that goes on, and instead of writing a CSS tutorial that shows you screenshots step by step, you can actually make a screencast and show live in the browser now how you can change the background color to a blue, for example, or something else. We put these transitions in there to, give you to, to make you aware what changes while you're editing it, and that's a pretty cool way to get somebody into CSS as well. The big problem that a lot of people don't understand is that uh, it doesn't matter how cool your stuff is, when your HTML is terrible, you're really hurting the web. And uh, not as much as we did in the past, but it's still a problem. And a lot of people don't realize why their HTML is wrong, what's wrong with it. So one thing uh, uh, a lot of browsers are thinking about right now, and we already implemented, is parser error highlighting in view source. So instead of having to validate your end code uh, with another step, you just do view source, and the red stuff shows you, OK, you made a parse error. It's not a full HTML uh, validator, but the parsing errors, the really, really problematic ones, are being shown to you. So you don't have to actually do something extra. So 
where it got really wild is when we realized we've got 3D in the browser now, so why don't we use that for debugging? So this is the source code of my blog, and it shows you the indentation, but sometimes you don't know just how far down the line you go. So Tilt is an extension that will go into, into Firefox itself that shows you in 3D how deep your indentation of your HTML is. And that's pretty sweet. That's like, uh, first of all, sorry, like, yeah, whatever. But it's, I see so many people realize you can now click the elements and do editing, much like you can do in Firebug, but you can do that actually in the browser in a 3D environment now. If your computer is not fast enough, you can also turn to a mesh instead of a full color one, so that might make it a bit faster, and you got all kind of settings there. Well, my blog is WordPress, so there's nothing special going on there. So I was wondering, let's, to look, let's take a look at some other things that are happening on the web and how their HTML looks like. So and I thought Facebook would be fun. <laughs> so let's type in Facebook and see what that looks like and switch to Tilt. Well, it looks, doesn't, it's not that problematic really, but if you look to Tilt, we actually visit Facebook City. Because if you look into that, and then you wonder why sometimes it does not, it does not render fast, you, what the hell is that thing on the right-hand side? That little tower thing, I have no idea. <laughs> but it's actually, you can right-click it and understand what's going on there. And it's an interesting visualization that we have this technology in the browser, but we don't use it for developing yet. We just use it for like, oh, look, I've got an interactive music video. Interesting was also Google. Because there's nothing on that page, but what the hell is going on there? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody explained it to me. I was just like, okay, fair enough. And to show you that I'm not kidding here, it's like I can actually show you my slides in Tilt. So this is now my slide deck that you're seeing here in HTML. And you see that the next slide is hidden and the next slide is going to come next. So it's live in the browser. It's not like any fake or anything. You can do that with any website out there. So I showed you a video of Tilt inside Tilt. It's a bit of an inception thing going on there. So that is all technical shit. That's all good. Fine. Uh, I'm actually more concerned about identity, who you are online. And it annoys me that over the years I've collected so many emails and identities that I switched and then totally forgot about. I left so many things behind that are actually dangerous out there. So uh, who are you on the web? I mean, you've got the echo machine here saying Spartacus, I'm Spartacus, I'm Spartacus. Anybody can be you on the web if you don't do it right and if you're not careful about it. So here's the need for login systems. That's a quite interesting one. There's this guy on YouTube who thought it was a good idea to say that he has an atheist nightmare simple question. He asked people to give him feedback as annotations completely open, and this is what the thing looked like after three minutes. Like there was nothing left of the video to see, none of these annotations actually were anything uh, uh, constructive, it was all like embarrassing things that you should do sexually to different animals, and these kind of things. But that's the problem. As soon as you put a, a, a comment form online, the spammers and the trolls of the web will flood it. And that's just sad that something as cool as the internet, as amazing as the internet, connecting us worldwide, is just used by the abusers and not by, by real people. And that's why we need to find a way to actually identify people on the web, sadly enough. I would love an internet that's completely open, where I don't need to know who you are to get good stuff. But that's just not the way it is right now, so we have to find a solution for that. Right now, our identification systems really, really suck. All of them. This is the normal way how to go on the web. I go to kittensrule.com. I find a cool kitten picture and I want to put a comment there. Fair enough, I click register. I enter a massive form with all my data. Normally these forms ask me all kinds of things that they don't need, like your birth date. Huh? Okay, I say a birth date, so I'm more than 18. I'm 18 now. Wow, you can show me pornography. That doesn't really mean that this person is really 18. Don't ask that kind of stuff. Enter a massive form. Choose a username that is not taken yet. That's getting me interesting as well, because you got like, that's why you got this Suzy5227 and these kind of usernames and other things that sell you iPads on, on Twitter. Provide an email to verify your identity because you actually have to say, okay, I just entered this form, and really it was me entering this form. Retrieve the email, and once you have the email, go back to the website, and then choose a password that is simple to memorize and secure like this one. 
And that's just not nice, is it? I mean, these passwords are the problem. The passwords are really the issue because people have to take secure passwords that are impossible to memorize. So the next time they're coming to that page, they go to kittensrule.com, they click the login because I'm now registered, right? They enter their username, they enter the password, damn, what was it again? It was something really clever, I remember. I was really, really secure there. was something really good going on. Then they try three times and they get asked to reset it. So they retrieve an email again to reset it, go back to the website and change the next password that is really, really hard to understand and to remember. And we're doing this over and over again. And the amount of time wasted on this is just staggering. So people use the same username and password everywhere. This is one of the things that happens. Which means if kittensrule.com is on WordPress and gets hacked, and you get the address, uh, the user table data, out of a sudden I can, hey, this Chris Heilman at gmail.com, he probably uses the same password on his online banking. So let's go to that one as well. So that's the real danger that people use the same information all over the web. They constantly reset passwords. A lot of traffic of any website is basically resetting the password because people forgot them. We open new accounts and let the old ones sleep. That's another thing as well. I know kids that I was at the, um, um, what is it, rewired state, young rewired state in England, 14 to 18 year old hackers. We gave them like government data and helped them how to build visualizations with it. They all had like 20 Gmail accounts because they forgot the password and just open a new one. And that's just dangerous because all this stuff stays on the web for eternity. So we're wasting a lot of time, money, and we leave insecure trails ripe for abuse later on. A, a, a login system that has not been used by you for a while will get attacked constantly and sooner or later will somebody will take it over from you without you realizing it. So third party login is the big solution for that. Okay, let's put a Twitter button on there, let's put a Facebook button on there. The main problem with that is that you overshare. I just want to go to kittensrule.com and put a comment there. But instead, I give them my identity, my name, my telephone number, my, my birth date, my friends list, who actually my friends shared with me what on Facebook and these kind of things. So you overshare, you give much more information than you should just to put a comment on a kitten picture. And uh, do you also know what that login button records? That's a big problem that Facebook had recorded like your user's history when they visited your website without telling them. And that's just not nice. That's not something you should, your users should get from your website. And what if the service goes down and becomes irrelevant? I mean, you remember probably these like uh, share on social networks, JavaScript, that had like 500 icons of all the different networks that you want to share your website with. Half of them are dead now. That's all cruff that we put on the web that should not be there anymore, but it's still there because nobody deletes that kind of stuff. So. The solution, one solution for that, that I'm getting incredibly excited about, um, I'm working with them right now, is browser ID. Browser ID, the way to log into kittensrule.com and put a comment is like this. You go to kittensrule.com, you click a button, you provide a verified email, verified email as your identity, and you watch kittens. This is all you have to do. Because all the other login systems fall back to an email. Every time you forget your password, you, send, you get your password reset link to an email. And that email is your main identity. That's what we realized. Like, why should you have to have anything else? Why should you give anything else but your email to the end user, to the end, end website? So this is Open Photo. Open Photo is another project uh, that we're part of and uh, friends of mine are actually doing. They actually try to take on Flickr. So instead of you storing all your, your data on Flickr, you store your photos wherever you want on the web, on S3, on your own server, on Flickr, on any other service. And then you can share it and you can actually ask for comments and get the, the social interface that is Flickr without the storage. Because your photos are where you want to have them and not where you need to go when you want to have them again. So again, you have like your normal interface here for surfing. You say like, oh, the Atomium in, uh, in, uh, in Belgium is awesome. So you sign in, you get this pop-up here that gives you your different identities. So you have not only one email in browser ID, you just have several that you want to have for different websites. So you can be different identities, you don't have to be one to rule them all. So you select your identity, it logs into current openphoto.me, and out of a sudden you have your identity up there. The icon we get from Gravatar, so you, if you don't have an icon there, it doesn't show up. We don't want you to have to provide a, uh, a photo if you don't want to. And you can easily switch your identities and log in with different identities without having to go through an extra 
uh, login flow or any OAuth or these kind of things. So it's a very simple way to identify yourself on the web as an email identity, which you already have. And we, before browser ID, we had open ID, and open ID was about a domain. And people never had the same connection to a domain that they have to an email. I have a, an email on my business card. This is me, not my company domain. So it's much easier to explain to people how to do that. You can store your emails as your identities inside browser ID. The validation happens on the browser and the trusted provider or your own server. So in this case right now, it's browserid.org is, uh, is the trusted provider, but you can do it on your own machine, and we're talking with Hotmail, with Gmail, with Yahoo Mail, all the mail providers to be that trusted provider, so you don't have to do that extra step. Browser ID is a protocol. It's not, it's not a service, and it's fully decentralized. So right now, we provide the servers. We bought lots and lots of hardware to make it to jumpstart it, but in the future, it could be on any server that you want that is trusted with the main browser ID group. It's driven by Mozilla, but it's independent of it. So other people are part of that. The, uh, we're working with the, uh, with the Open Rights Group to think about it as well. The UK government is interested in actually using it for government websites, which makes me really excited. And it works in any modern browser and Internet Explorer, Internet Explorer 8 as well. And it's a JavaScript library and a validation service at the moment. That's all you need to do to have a login system for your websites. You can also have an add-on to avoid the pop-up. So that's where it's going to go in the future. Instead of having a pop-up window, you will have it as part of your browser. So next to your URL bar, your emails will show up, and you can basically just select the one you want to log into that website that you are on at the moment. And how cool is that, that my identity becomes part of the interface that I control, not some random pop-up that might be fished. Sites, email providers can become identity providers. We do not give access to your emails. We just give the email address out there. That email address could be one that you made up. I mean, as long as it redirects to a real email, that's fine. But we don't, you don't have to share your social graph. You don't have to share other data. And that's the problem right now. If I want to sign up for kittensrule.com, I don't want to give them my, uh, my relationship data or my friend's data. I don't have to give that out, and I should not be forced to just because it's easy to do. So apps won't store your data at all, which means that hacks are less dangerous. If kittensrule.com get hacked later on, they won't have your username and password. They just know an email, and that's it. And that's not that hard to protect then. You can have several identities, and you can allow browser ID to remember them. So next time you go to kittensrule.com, it automatically realizes you want to beat chris at gmail.com and not the other emails that you have. So this is my beautiful interface that I built with that. Darn it, I don't know you. You click on it. You always see the domain that you're actually logging into. So in this case, now I have my two emails. I want to be chris heilman, and I log into the webrocks.com, and then woohoo, I know you. This is how easy it was to build this. The code behind that is this. Right now, we have this JavaScript shim that later on will be part of the browsers, so we don't need to use that anymore. You can say navigator.id ver get verified email function assertion. And if you get an assertion back from the browser or from the JavaScript library in this case, then you actually go and verify it with a simple AJAX call or uh, use jQuery or whatever you want to do to go to your server and verify it. Otherwise, like, who are you? I don't know yet. Verifying the email, in my case, in PHP, because I'm old, is uh, I basically just say I get the assertion back from the JavaScript, I then a URL encode, the webrocks.com. So, so part of the validation process is you only validate against the domain. And that domain, the script that validates, has to be on that domain. So that gets verified in the background. So there's a proper OAuth protocol behind it. And you just do a call call, and you're done. And that is all you need to do to have a verified user. So people comment on that, and you, have their, you don't have their identity, but you know that they're a verified user. And you should not have to ask for people identities just for comments out there. So let's quickly talk about apps. When apps came out, there were this massive thing. All of a sudden, we're like, this is so cool. Like, we have these iPhones and stuff, and now we got little icons to click on. This is something new. This is a revolution. And we can make so much money with that. It's going to be awesome. And they were kind of a revolution, I have to say. I mean, screen estate on mobile phones is small. So having a browser there with a browser bar and like all the things and clicking links and zooming in and out of websites is not nice. It's not really fun to do. 
But so apps had a better use case because they were full screen and it actually worked for you. Clicking a button is much easier than typing an address on a mobile phone. That's why passwords on a mobile phone are really painful as well. And browser ID is another solution for that. No more password typing on a mobile phone. How awesome is that? Built for the system they run on, apps were always better than websites on mobile phones or iPhones because they were actually built for the system. Much like the code that we've written for Commodore 64 was optimized for Commodore 64 and would look shit on Amiga. So there's no wonder that these things are better or richer than others because they're actually built for that purpose. And of course, there were dreams of massive monetization and the market actually did this, like, oh, you're the 12 year old hacker in his garage built this app on an iPhone and now he's got five Ferraris and he has to wait six years before he can drive them. <laughs> it's, it's fading out. People are realizing that not that many people are actually making money with apps. And uh, a lot of companies throw out an app a minute and make money that way, but it's just flooding the interface again. It's flooding the market and it's not scaling the way it actually should be. The issues with native apps I had, for example, or I have, upgrades mean replacement of whole apps. So when Angry Birds, a new one comes out, and I'm not on my data plan, it says like, do you want to download this 14 meg on like uh, 7 pound 50 per meg just to get a new level of Angry Birds? Why isn't, the ang why isn't the level a JSON object that I can load quickly from the web? like a web application would be doing it. We learned for years and years to decentralize updates from the main core of the applications. With, uh, with native apps, we don't do that yet. Syncing across devices is not happening. I played Angry Birds on five different devices and I always had to start the levels new. You're like, really? Like, I, I had this level already. I just want to go on in the game on the bigger screen this time. And it, it still does not work that way. They don't sync to each other. App Store placement is the new SEO. If you look at like uh, app stores and you build the coolest, newest app and you want to have it listed, good luck. You either go to a Mechanical Turk and you buy like 5,000 people to review it and say it's the best app ever, or you actually call it exclamation mark ampersand my app and then it will list uh, automatically when people list by alphabet. The icon model also doesn't scale. Like, I've got few apps that I can do, but then you see people having folders with little apps in them, and then they switch from switch to switch to switch. Like, we have a Finder and we have Explorer on the desktop, and that actually makes much more sense to go through applications like that. So it's really not, the screen estate use is really not there anymore. So what we're thinking about is a hybrid approach uh, uh, to apps, and there's going to be big things coming out that way. And I think it's very cool for, first of all, it's HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript. We've bloody proven that the web can be cool for years using these technologies. You don't need to use other technologies. It's so easy to find developers for that stuff. It's so easy to learn that technology. I don't have to download Xcode with a few gig just to write my first application. I do a text editor or use Cloud9 IDE and start it. And the web is a distribution model. Like, why do you have an app store and you wonder when nobody finds your app when the, when the internet is already there and search engines and social media also allow you to send people to your apps and back and forth? And web intents tie into existing data stores, and that's something that gets me really excited, which is run by, by uh, Chrome team and by, uh, by Mozilla, and I'm going to show you that in a second. So this is how they look like at the moment. So uh, at the moment it's an extension, but it's going to come natively into the browser soon. And Chrome already has their apps, so that's a different story. So in this case here, I have an apps tab, and I see my apps. I click on the app, and it becomes a full screen application. It's not a website in there. It takes over the browser, and there's only an app tab up there. The other tabs are still open, but you can open a new window if you want to, and that wouldn't even happen anymore. So it has a full screen uh, interface, much like any um, tablet app would have. And it allows you to use HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in a very rich manner to build an interface like that. Now, what if you have an app and you want people to find it? Let's say Twitter.com has an open app. You see there's a pop-up coming up there that is an app available. The way they do that is put a meta tag in their page and, say, and link it to a manifest file. And that way, we out of a sudden know, hey, there's also a Twitter app. So you can install the application instead of using the Twitter website, rather than asking people to go somewhere else. The next thing we thought about, and we need feedback on that, is if you now do, go to a New York Times link and you open it in a new tab, it opens in the application in interface rather than in the normal website interface. So we could integrate your applications to your normal browsing flow on the web. 
which is, uh, to me, it's powerful. To other people, it could be confusing, but it actually works, I think. Now, the next thing is web intents. Web intents are, means decoupling services from your JavaScripts and your applications. Right now, uh, say I want to have a photo because I got this really cool sepia uh, filter thing going on. Where, how do I get a photo? I ask people to upload it from their hard drive. Most people have their photos not on their hard drive anymore. They have it on Flickr, they have it on, uh, uh, on SkyDrive, not really, but uh, they have it on Google services, they got it on Smugma, they got it on TwitPic. We have our photos all over, all over the web already. So what do you do? You ask them to upload or you authenticate with all these services and ask them for access for their photos. And again, you have that oversharing problem. Like, I access your TwitPic, and it probably allows me to post pictures without me realizing it. And I never read the, like, oh, this has access to this, and then, yeah, whatever. I just want to upload a photo. So with web intents, you have a JavaScript call that's, uh, that's called get photo. And you click on that one, and then the browser knows what systems you're actually using. So in this case, the browser was already authenticated with Flickr. And I can upload photos from Flickr directly without giving that website access to Flickr itself. So the, as the browser knows what I'm using, I don't need to know what kind of service you have. I don't want to know because it's your service. And then I can change it with a great sepia filter and I can post it back to Flickr, not by authenticating my application with Flickr, but just using your browser because you're already logged in. So you, could, you have full control as the end user over your storage of your data on the web. And me as an app developer, all I have to do is like get photo, post photo, share, share bookmark. It's all the different things that we do in applications decentralized out there. So the web intents and activities really rock because uh, it's reuse of existing services without giving access. I should not be allowed to read all your photos if all I want is you to upload one photo from Flickr. It should be in your control, and with web intents, it completely is in your control because it's, uh, it's your browser doing it rather than our servers talking to Flickr. And you keep storage of the data at the hands of the user. So I don't care where you store it. If you want to shift from Flickr to another service, you just do it in your browser. You don't even have to tell me about this. And this is very, very powerful. So one of the last things is about going mobile, our little Firefox here. And it annoys me. I love having these things that are like four times as fast as my first computer in my pocket. And it annoys me that I can't use the technologies that I love, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, to build things with it. It annoys me that half of the thing is not available to me because I, I'm not a Java programmer and I'm not a sad person. So we have this website called Army Mobile yet that shows you all the things that are in a mobile phone. And it shows you in green and red which ones are available as open standards in JavaScript and open protocols in web technology already. So we're defining, uh, together with, uh, uh, with several mobile phone providers and several browser providers, we're defining APIs into these systems, what you can do. And this is pretty impressive what you can do already, like Opera you can take pictures with, Firefox you can take pictures with, over a mobile phone by now. So we're opening them one by one because it's just unfair that you have to, have to be a developer for a certain product just to support one hardware because hardware changes all the time. So boot to gecko is one thing that we're working on, and that's basically a set of APIs and a set of services that actually make it available for you as an HTML, JavaScript, and CSS developer to use mobile phones. So these are screenshots of a real running interface on the mobile phone, uh, on the Nexus S in this case, um, using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and WebGL. There's really no closed technology in that one. So what we have is we have these icons with a nice icon view, much you have on the, on the thing as well. You've got your dialer, you've got your address book. You can send text messages already over JavaScript. That is already working. And we're opening that up one by one. And to make an inception thing again, we have a browser inside your browser, inside a framework written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Much like Cloud9 IDE is written in JavaScript and HTML and Cloud9 IDE itself. So in the future, if you support it and you help us with that, you can take the technologies that you're using for the web right now on mobile phones, on tablets, on everything out there, because we've proven with the web that it works. We've proven that you can make money. We've proven that, that people can contribute to it. 
We've proven that, uh, uh, that it's easy to do, easy to change, internationalizable, much more accessible. We have all these things there already, and we're just blocked out because some people say, well, you've got to be a Java guy or, or a Cocoa guy to write things for mobile phones. So how can you help? And everybody can. Look at this dog. I mean, probably he's going to change the main thing about the car there. More honesty, less ninjas. You don't need to be a superhero to be part of all these systems, to be part of this discussion, to be part of that process. We don't need like, oh, well, we need this JavaScript guy to sort us out. No, we need five JavaScript guys who are all not amazing, but actually have good ideas discussing with each other to make this thing work. Like the, can you draw the ship? No, I can't. Be honest about it and don't oversell yourself. At the same time, we need you. And nobody should be, uh, should be not allowed to say what they mean just because they're unknown. There's no point in that. So play with browser ID. There's also, uh, uh, the, the, it's open out there. The, the system is there. You saw the, the code that I showed is all you really need. You just, start your, uh, you just start your session after this because you have the verification. Build apps with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Stop saying like, okay, it's okay that I have to do something else. Show that we can, beautiful, we can do beautiful, beautiful things in these open technologies. Play with the dev tools and give feedback, especially UX people, especially designers. It's no point telling me on Twitter that the thing looks shit. It makes much more sense to actually go on uh, uh, to, go to tell the team about this or show people how you get stuck, what the problem with them are. All of this is completely open, so we do it for you. So feedback from you should help us make it better, not frustrate us. Review the browser ID field guide that is, uh, uh, that is on GitHub. Just you look for browser ID field guide. This is a step-by-step -step introduction to browser ID that we give out to everybody that wants to use browser ID. So if that thing is not understandable or could be done better, it's an open system on GitHub. You can write, art, uh, you can write sections of it. You can edit things. You can write translations of it. It's a beautiful thing that we, can, that we share with you. Join the mailing list and visit us on ircmozilla.org or HTML5 on Freenode. That's where all the Google guys and Mozilla guys and Opera guys hang out as well. And tweet, blog, and talk all about this. We need people to understand that the open web is there to stay, and we can build cool shit that is as amazing as closed technologies. We just need your help to do it. And that is all I had, so thank you very much. Thank you, Christian.